Hey, everyone. So two quick things. First, my Facebook group page for The Suzanne Venker Show is back up. I'd been using that page for something else, but I have since moved it back to a private page just for listeners of The Suzanne Banker Show. I want a place where you all can talk with each other and where I can chime in periodically with questions and comments myself. So be aware that if you're itching to talk about the things you're hearing on this program, there is now a place to do that. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Suzanne's group. And if for some reason that doesn't work, just try going to Facebook and typing in the Suzanne Banker show and hopefully it will come right up and then click on join. Okay. Secondly, when was the last time you took a hot second to write a review of this podcast? I get super sad when I check it periodically and no one's written anything in like a week. I just wanted to tell you how much those reviews mean to me and to the algorithms too. Pretty sure the more reviews there are, the more the show will appear in other people's um, feeds and whatnot. So if you think you'll forget, like I know I probably would, keep in mind you can pause this program right now and do it and you won't miss a thing when you come back. We'll still be here in the same spot. That's my favorite thing about podcasts. They're like DVR, which is so awesome. Okay, on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I am here today with Liz Durham, who I think was on one other time. A couple months ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. couple. Okay. Um, to talk about this, this topic of how to nest in a culture that wants you to earn, which I certainly could have done on my own, but I thought Liz would be perfect to have with me since you may or may not recall, she has moved from full on working mom with several kids mode to full-time stay-at-home mom. And so she has um, a podcast herself called Being Different. I think I have alerted you all to that and highly recommended it where she's she has on several guests um, and also reflects on her own experience in this transition. So welcome back, Liz. Thank you for having me, Suzanne. Glad to be here. Sure. So, okay, I want to I want to start by um, telling everybody about your June 1st episode of Being Different where you basically reflected on your new life as a stay-at-home mom and how that has just rocked your world, essentially, Mm -hmm. being uh, 30. How old are you again? I'm 33. 33. And by the way, everybody, she's pregnant with her third due in September. So she is in the swing of things. Um, So yeah, give everybody just sort of an overview of what you talked about in that episode. Sure. So I left my job about five months ago. And prior to that, I had been working from home, um, but still full time doing nannies, daycare, babysitters, all the things. And so it got to be too much. Like I couldn't handle it. All the things that you talk about on your show, Suzanne, I was experiencing in my life. And that's how I ended up finding you. But um, we decided to leave my job. I'd be a stay at home mom. Thankfully, my husband was very supportive of that and able to provide. So it was not a big deal as far as that goes. But the transition to being a stay at home mom, I was naive about, I guess you would say, maybe not naive, but by some of the things that I've been learning and experiencing. So, um, Obviously, one of the first things that was difficult for me was dealing with the money. Um, We had always had our finances separate, so we just joined those together a couple months ago. So we're going through that right now. And my husband had like never paid for groceries before or anything like that. And um, so what I had said in that podcast episode was, even if you didn't have your finances joined right when you're married, you should definitely join them before you have kids. Because if you join them, like after you have two kids and you've been together for years and you don't know each other's spin habits or anything like that, like that's a real shock to the system. Um, 
And so I wouldn't say we've been fighting, but he'll be like, what are these grocery bills? And I'm like, we eat, (laughs) you know, just things that he's not used to and vice versa. Like I see things that I'm like, what are you spending money on? He's like, I've always spent money on these things and you've never cared before. Like, why do you care now? Now, And I have a question about that. I didn't know we were going to, it's fine that we're talking about money, but I, cause that is one part of it. But what, why did you, I'm thinking this through as you're talking. So it's interesting to me that you combined, is that only because of our coaching together or mm-hmm. what was the reason that you combined after you quit as opposed to before? Well, we did quit. We combined before I quit, um, but I didn't have to start taking money from him until after I quit. So like we had our accounts joined together, but I wasn't actually like spending money on the family credit card until I quit my job because I was like blowing through my savings and like, well, clearly I'm not going to be able to do that anymore if I'm a stay at home mom. So um, we, I, we combined when, I guess that was a couple months ago when we were doing the coaching, Okay. but the actual money coming from his side of things started once I quit my job. Got it. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. So that was a shock. And then it was with that coupled to the appreciation thing. So I'm like, before I had paid for housekeepers, I paid for, you know, people to take care of the things that had to be done around the house because I was working. And so I'm learning how to raise kids. Even though my child is three, I'm just now learning kind of like at zero. Mm. Um, And that's hard because your child has a standard that they're used to, and you have a standard that you're used to. And it's not like you're starting when they're a newborn and they can't talk and you're learning together. Like we're both being thrown into a totally different thing. So when my husband would come home and expect a beautiful dinner and a perfectly clean house, and I'm like exhausted and it looks like a bomb has gone off because I've like kept the kids alive. That's a, a rough thing to deal with. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because if you'd been there from day one, he potentially might have seen what actually goes on that makes it so difficult in the first three years that you couldn't get dinner on the table. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Yeah. And so it's like, for me, it takes time to learn how to do any job. Mm -hmm. And so, and being a stay at home mom is not excluded from that. Like you Mm -hmm. don't just know how to be a stay at home mom. And so like, to be a stay at home mom that has a well run home that's well kept and organized like that's not just something you can just do like day 1 not for me at least nobody nobody can liz you know <laughs> like and some days are better than others like some days the kids will nap at the same time and i can get like clean and organized but if they don't nap at the same time and so i don't have one single minute to myself like i'll get one room clean and then they've destroyed the next room by the time i finish that and so it's like those kind of expectations, I just didn't know that would be so hard on me because at, at my job, I get a lot of praise and a big yeah. paycheck, you know, and, so, and so that's you don't why have that at home. Exactly. And that's why I wanted to do this episode for people who are in your boat, either they're starting out from, you know, staying home from the get-go or they're coming home later, but they're stepping into territory that is absolutely foreign mm-hmm. to them because they have not been set up for this life. Yeah. And that's something that's, it's really hard to watch as someone from my generation because it, it just wasn't that, I mean, I'm sure there are people my age who could identify with that, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it is today where you are just shooting blanks for so many reasons. So I wanted to open this sort of by talking about, um, something that most of our, my listeners will obviously already know, but you had had on this guy, named Mark Mathabane from Nigeria uh, last earlier this month. And it was fascinating listening to him identify the significance of family and mothers at home, given his background. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so I listened very carefully to that and, and wrote a few things down that he said that I want to repeat. And then I'm going to do a little clip from what he said. The first thing that struck me was when he said, without exception, Without exception, most of our problems stem from what has happened to the American family. And he he, he gives a little backdrop there of explaining how 23% of American children are born to broken families compared to, for example, China, 
which is at 3%. And Nigeria, where he is from, is 4%. And even in India, it's about 6%. Mm -hmm. And he notes that in those cultures, here in the U.S., here in the U.S., some of the most educated and highest earning groups here are those folks. And how fascinating that is because there's a connection between their success in that realm, that kind of success, and stable families. And Mark's own father and mother had a very different story. Um, but he even un with his story, um, he he recognized the significance of family. And so he gives this little backdrop of um, how his father, who was illiterate and alcoholic and abusive, but he disciplined Mark. Um, and something about the police coming. I didn't get why. I don't know if you remember that. He grew up under apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So it was illegal for a family, a black family to live together back then. So they would like come and bust up his home um, and try to take, like separate the father from the mother and the kids. It was crazy what he grew up under. Okay. So he um, describes how the police came one day, although that wasn't just one time, but this one day where he came and he was always the last one to escape out the back. Oh mm -hmm. my God, this is so sad. Just to even hear about it. Okay. So I'm going to play this clip now of what he then said. What's that telling me? And he recognizes that one person, the mother, has to remain to take care of the children. So he is protecting. So you protect and you provide. This has nothing to do with this nonsense about all oh, patriarchy oppresses, etc. It is in the nature of who we are. Somebody must protect and must provide. It's just that we have come to the point where we now need to have a team doing that. But still, the responsibility has to be allocated based on our nature. Right. And nature. women are generally more nurturing. And so I think that, like, you know, the husbands, mm -hmm. they serve a role protecting and provide and the mom nurtures and cares for the family and it's a team it's not one person trying to embody all of these aspects that aren't natural to them you know but it's our society tells us you don't, you don't need a man you can do it all by yourself and then you wonder why you have these angry pissed off bitchy women and it's like well god didn't make you to do it all by yourself you know <clears throat> So you can imagine why I why I chose that clip because that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Is this is an episode for people who have been raised to think that there are no differences and that you're supposed to be able to do it all, and and then you get into the nesting phase of your life and you're like, what the hell, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, one last thing that Mark said was that everything quote everything that blows up in society. I loved this one. Everything that blows up in society has its beginnings somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it could be nipped in the bud if people were not so self-absorbed. And of course, One you have to, you have to listen to the he, whole episode for that. Yeah. But he's talking about family instability and the, and the family, choice. Yeah, yeah. And one thing he said about that that I really agreed with was he was like, if people would sit around the table and talk to each other at mealtimes, we would notice a lot of these issues that our kids or husband or wife are having. Amen. And yeah be able to get on top of them but we just don't do that anymore no that was a great that was a great point too so anyway i highly recommend that that episode as well but for now i wanted to just offer and go through a list that's kind of a countercultural guide for women who are i don't know roughly 40 and younger who were raised at a time in which motherhood has been sidelined right or even rejected in some cases altogether um, because those folks have a much harder go of it than did previous generations of women um, you know, we, we know right now that family, especially the needs of children used to be front and center, but that's no longer the case, which means that many women, and then by default men, let's say their husbands are just men in general, because they tend to go where women lead when it comes to this particular subject are shooting blanks. Like I said before, when it comes to nesting, in other words, I don't know how to do marriage and motherhood because they've been groomed to be career women first and foremost, which again, which is why I wanted to have you on. Mm -hmm. So let's go through um, just some of these things that, uh, you know, I want to say could have been avoided if people had taught this to their children earlier on, but in any case are going to be learned when you do embrace and get into that nesting phase of life. So number one, Accepting the reality 
of male and female nature. Or sorry, let me not accepting, accept the reality of male and female nature and the entire experience will feel lighter. Mm -hmm. Um, And for those of you who remember my conversation with Lauren, just a couple episodes ago, episodes ago, episode 175, that was titled how to be in a relationship when the roles are reversed. This is, um, this is what I'm talking about when you've set up to believe that your relationship, you know, there's such thing as equality and that men and women are interchangeable. You are constantly fighting a battle that is already difficult enough without that battle. And that when you learn to embrace the way God made us, which isn't to say there isn't overlap and everybody's exactly the same because they're not, but the general framework of what you said to Mark at that point about women are generally more nurturing than men, your relationship all of a sudden feels easier. Yes. Has that been your experience? Absolutely. And it's, it's only been five months. So I haven't been doing it for very long. I'm not that good at it yet, but um, you know, it's funny because like, Luke is earning the money now and I'm supposed to be taking care of the house and raising our kids. And so even like, um, I don't know the day-to-day stress that I felt in working. I thought it was because I had to earn all this money and keep the house clean and take care of the kids and be a wife, all these things. But I think a lot of it is just, it wasn't even that I was doing too many things is that I was doing the wrong things that I didn't need to be doing. Explain. That's good. Um, I didn't need to feel the pressure to provide for our family. My husband could do it. So why was I putting that on myself? And when I let him do it, I thought like, this is going to sound crazy. I thought like, oh, this is going to stress him out. It's going to be so terrible. Do you know what, Suzanne? His business has increased since I quit my job. Now, I don't know if that's because he's working harder or because I'm making life easier for him at home so he can have more time to focus on his career. So Liz, I have, you know, as you know, I haven't met Luke, Mm -hmm. but I can almost guarantee it's the latter Mm -hmm. now. And I want to preface this by saying, in your case, you do have a higher earner husband, but I have worked with people and known for a fact that even if you're not married to a quote unquote high earner, even if he's a moderate earner, let's just say, Mm -hmm. um, or even on the lower side. There's something about that uh, space that you're giving him to shine when you're not stepping in. Mm -hmm. And this is hard for a lot of women to accept, especially if they've gotten themselves into a space where they quote unquote depend so much on her, on her income. Mm -hmm. Um, But the best thing to do for your relationship, if you've set it up opposite the way you originally had, is to undo it as much as possible. So for some people, it's not going to be stopping altogether the way you did. But there are things that can be done to counterbalance the, the male-female nature thing. So you hit the nail on the head. I guarantee you he felt emboldened to step up even more because as long as men know that you're carrying the load part, they're going to let you, they're not going to fight you and say, don't do that because they think that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And so they're torn between wanting you to be happy and do what he thinks you want and also wanting to be the provider. And, And that's a very hard space for them. And so they will naturally pull back and let you shine because that's also in their nature to do. It's very complicated. You know, because it's a hard place for them to be. It's almost like they're dependent on you to figure it out so that they can then respond accordingly. (laughs) You know, I talked to this guy, Trevor, and he said, Liz, it's so simple. Men just want peace and women want security. And I was like, oh, like Luke never told me I had to quit working or anything like that. He told me I could keep working because he wanted peace and he wanted me to be happy. You're exactly right. But I, I don't know if he realized or not, like how much anxiety and issues it was causing by supporting me and working when I Absolutely. didn't need to be, you know? Absolutely. It's not until that absence of that, that, and it takes months, like you said, it's going to continue happening. By the way, I guarantee you, you're going to start, mm-hmm. you're going to see things a year from now. It just keeps yeah. uh, multiplying and multiplying to really look back and say, oh my God, what were we, what were we dealing with before? Um, and as, and as long as that, yeah. 
it's 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 complicated and, and it's and it's a tender subject because people you know either they don't want to hear it they don't believe it um they think they can't survive without it the way that it is and it just kind of depends on the circumstances i'm not again saying everybody can do exactly what you did um but anyway so the the message there is to the more you accept the reality that men and women are not interchangeable and that they, once children come along, each have a very unique and distinct role and that that's okay. That's the, that's the kicker there. That's okay. That has nothing to do with inequality. That has nothing to do with value. It's just the way we are. And the more you move with the biological tide, the smoother your relationship's going to be. And I think that women have to take, we've been taught to be prideful and being providers, which is not natural. But for someone like me, like I had to accept, I can do the laundry. I can learn to cook. I can learn to teach the kids and all that stuff. And I can take pride in those things too. It doesn't have to be an earning a massive paycheck. And so I think once you can kind of take your pride out of the equation a little bit, at least for me, that's helped a lot Yeah, and learn to take pride in the other things. Like he will come in. He told me we're on a vacation right now. He was like, who are you, Susie Homemaker? This is the most organized we've ever been on a trip before because I actually spent like a lot of <laughs> time packing and making sure we had all the things we need and stuff when usually when we go on vacation, it's an absolute shit show. And so I was like, instead of thinking like, oh, he's making some derogatory comment by calling me Susie Homemaker, I'm like, I did a yeah. good job, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's made things way more enjoyable for our family this and time. And more peaceful. I mean, yes. who wants chaos when you can yes. have peace? I mean, that's right. another thing that this this new role of yours brings to the table. And there's no there's no amount of money or, or value that, that is, what am I trying to say? You can't, you can't um, overstate the value, that's what I'm trying to say, of creating that peace in the yeah. home. So that there is less conflict um, for you and the kids too. I think for you and the kids and it. value. And so to value that you're right. And then also fear, you know, some people yeah. are doing it strictly out of fear. They think that if they're not earning that, that, that he won't mm-hmm. or they can't when more often than not, it's about how you're um, allocating your funds, but that's a whole nother conversation. We're not going to do that today. And I think that we, as women don't think that they're capable. They usually are. And usually. they usually will step up to the challenge mm-hmm. if you give them the space to do so. Definitely. Oh, and also one final thing about that. They don't view, pressure does not affect them the same way it affects us. We are Absolutely. very taxed by taking on that role. They are emboldened. So mm-hmm. pressure, a lot of men, I mean, my husband will say this. I, you know, he does actually, he doesn't love pressure, but he needs it. Mm-hmm. And he'll say that to, to, to move forward. They He's not, it, it doesn't like dr- drain him of like, you know, the, it doesn't cause him to cry and whole, like that would, for right. me, it's like the pressure, like, ah! yeah. mm-hmm. um, and again, not all men are this way and all women are this way, but generally speaking, women are far more taxed by this role and went and men are more emboldened by it. Yep. Okay. Number two, number two is more about understanding the culture versus the truth, the reality and your actual de- desires. It doesn't actually take a village to raise children. It takes a family. Mm -hmm. And so that is the complete opposite of what most people in their 20s and 30s or even 40s have been raised to believe, which is that it takes a village. I think that started with Hillary Clinton. I mean, not that she took, she didn't create the phrase, but she definitely Mm -hmm. used it a lot. You need to reject cultural messaging and not let the politics undermine what you can see for yourself to be true. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the village, but I don't want the village anywhere near my kids because the village (laughs) is not doing great right now. The village is a shit show. (laughs) I let the village raise my kids for a while and it did not turn out well. Um, It's so much better when they have a parent who a parent loves their kid more than anyone else. So to think that you can drop your kid off at daycare and they're going to love your kid the same way that you do is just stupid. Anyone knows that regardless of what your politics are. Um, Also, the village now is not what the village used to be. Like the village used to be your neighbors would be outside and all the kids would play together. Now neighbors don't even talk to each other. They don't even know who each other are anymore. And so it's not what it used to be. If you go into Africa and look at a true village that's raising kids together, those people 
if a kid is out getting in trouble, they will protect that kid and bring them back to their parents. Or if the kid needs to be disciplined, they will discipline them. Now we don't allow any of that mm -hmm. to happen in our society. So with my son, he was acting out terribly because he didn't have me as an attachment figure. He had different caretakers all the time. Um, he didn't have any consistency. So he didn't know what the expectations were because they were different with every single person. So now that I'm at home, and this is what I meant earlier by trying to do something when they're three versus when they're zero. We're trying to set the expectations for a three-year-old, mm -hmm. but even in the five months that I've been at home, like he knows if I do X, then this is what the consequence is going to be good or bad. And so if you have one consistent person in their life, which hopefully it's the mother, then the child is more secure because they know what the expectations are and you feel happier because it's not like kids aren't going to act out. Of course, they're always going to act out, but the tantrums and stuff are going to be far less frequent than they were if they're in daycare. And another piece of that, um, I was going to talk about the discipline in daycare later, but I'm just going to, let's just do that now, combine it with what we're talking about. Um, sleep, sleep. Uh, yeah. When you have your kids in daycare, they are not there. I don't care what anyone tells you, me they're not getting the sleep they need. There's no yeah. way because you're, you're, you're coordinating their sleep around where they have to be every day. So the sleep, lack of sleep or sleep deprivation is a huge, like 70%, in my opinion, piece of why discipline doesn't work in daycare. In addition mm -hmm. to the fact that you have high turnover and nobody's, there's no one attachment figure. That's maybe, maybe it's 50, 50, but cause that's very significant as well, but we don't talk enough about the sleep factor and how that cast you've got to have that to become healthy. And so, and you've got to be able to have that in order to discipline. Yeah. So, and it's, it's at like unrealistic to, if you have an exhausted kid who's been in daycare all day to take them to a restaurant at night and they're throwing a temper tantrum and to like lose your mind on the kid. Like, well, they're, they're tired and they need to be at home, like just exactly. chilling out or playing. So like the, when we get mad at them and expect them to act like adults, when we haven't let them sleep and they haven't had consistent discipline all day, it's stupid. And it's, it's unfair insane. to the child it, it, for us to treat them that way. Absolutely. And I, do you feel like I struggled with this for a long time and my, my conclusion, and I don't know if it's just my wanting to believe, you know, in the best of people as opposed to the worst, which I think generally I try to do. I truly do believe it's ignorance. I don't believe that they know they're doing this and they, I mean, as a whole, and they're doing it anyway. I, I truly believe it's ignorance because of what I'm doing this episode for, which is that you had no grooming or education about the significance of children's needs. And you have not been taught to prioritize the nesting phase. So you're coming into this space basically clueless. What is that what you see or believe or not? For me, I don't think it's ignorance. I think that we're taught like the messaging in our society is to do the opposite of what our instincts and nature tells us to do. So like when I went to drop Mac off at daycare for the first time, I knew that was wrong. I was crying and he was crying. So like mm. that's your body and your nature telling you not to do that. But then you go home and you talk to your friends and you consult your peers and all these people around you. And they're like, it's good for them. Yeah. Socialization, yeah. all the bullshit that society tells us that's just straight up lies. And so then you're like, well, if this is what everyone's saying, then I guess I have to go along with it. So I feel like it's mm. like, you know, it's wrong, mm. but then you just the power accept, of persuasion. Well, that's what yeah. everybody else is doing. And these experts say I should be doing it. So I guess I should. Do okay. It. So you think it's more group think? I do. Then, and I then think it's like ignorance. brainwashing. I yeah. think the feminists have done an excellent job of brainwashing us. For sure. Well, I mean, obviously, I totally agree with that. Um, but that's a good point because, and and I, you know, I don't know what the percentages are. Maybe it's a little bit of both. But um, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Like, can you? Can you? I'm not really brainwashable. I don't think in general <laughs> myself. I'm sure I have been, but in general, I tend to be very, very uh, defiant in that respect. So can you get brainwashed enough to where you believe it? Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I believed it because I told you I was in agony for three years, yeah, true. So, oh. uh, but I think you just like are told you need to be earning, you don't mm -hmm. need a man, you need all these things to make yourself secure. And so you just, you constantly, you're lying to yourself. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And you justify it. You use other people to help you justify the lies to yourself over and over. Okay. So that was number two. It doesn't take a village. It takes a family. Number three, it's not about you. It's not about you. Now this might sound really oh, wait, obvious. I to- want to go back to one okay. more thing on the last one. Also, since I've come home on the take, it takes a family thing. You also have to realize it takes a husband and a wife. So like, as okay. far, I've been learning a lot about, um, play and like, especially how important it is for boys to like mm-hmm. learn how to be rough and how mm-hmm. to like get control of their bodies and their emotions and stuff. And that's not something a mom can teach to a son. That's something a dad Agreed. needs to teach to 100%. a son. But I think moms think like, oh, I've got, I can, and I should teach everything to my kids and I don't need a man. You do need a man. There are certain things that kids need to learn from a dad that the mom just I mean, cannot teach. No question about it. This is why uh, children of single mothers fare far worse than, and again, yeah. very politically incorrect, very difficult to swallow because we have so many single mothers today, some of whom it's not their doing and or their fault and some of whom it is. But mm-hmm. regardless of how you got there, the reality is the reality. It's just we have young men who had no fathers bottom line. And it's, it's a, it's a disaster. And anyway, that's another conversation, but anyway, thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So number three, it's not about you. Um, Sounds really obvious, but in a culture that has made you the center of the universe, this is a difficult transition to get comfortable with both sacrifice, which is what motherhood is, 75% of it, 85, 90, sacrifice, and the long game. Both of those things really summarize motherhood. It's about sacrifice and playing the long game. And this culture is all about the here and the now and the you, 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 or me, 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 me. So that transition is just, I can see it in young women. It's, I mean, it's hard for anybody, any generation. I'm not just specifying this. I mean, I had a hard time with it. And I, I mean, you know, because it's so jarring, but to not have the support or to not have any experience with doing that, or to not have been raised to understand that is, has got to be a thousand times worse. Yeah. And I think, so I've been doing a ton of research on the birth control pill. I feel like that's kind of when this all started as they Mm -hmm. said, oh, we're giving the power to women you don't have to let kids ruin your life anymore. Like you should be more self-centered, go get a career, chase all these things. Um, When in reality, if you do it younger, you don't have all these like issues with infertility and all that stuff. It's much easier on your body. You have more energy, but also you don't grow up so self-centered. Like I didn't have Mac till I was 30 and I was making a lot of money at that point. And I'd been on all these vacations and done all these things. So I was incredibly, incredibly self-centered. So is Luke. So then it's a big shock when you have a kid and you're like, well, wait a second, I have to get up in the middle of the night. God forbid I do that. I can't, I can't just fly to Mexico whenever I want to, you know, like things have to revolve around this little person who needs you, but that's how it should be. You should learn to be responsible for other human beings and put them above your own needs. This to me is one of a very strong reason for for having children younger, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's much more difficult to go down in your standard of living than it is to go up. Absolutely. And if you're going to be a stay at home mom, like once you've started making all that money, and mm-hmm. then if you don't have a husband who's a super high earner, if you take that away, you might have to like get new cars. You might have to move to a smaller house. So it could be much more jarring than if you kind of like ease into it as you're growing up together, you know? Very much so. Very much so. I mean, it's fun to like start out not having as much much money as you do later. I mean, that's part of the the climb together as a family, even if you're not earning, even if you're home, you're climbing with your spouse, Um, at least ideally. That's that's the way it used to be. It's better for the children, too, because you're not trying to buy their happiness. You have to learn how to play with them outside and with little, if you don't, if you can't just go to the store and buy whatever you want, every time they want something, then they're not as spoiled. And so I feel like for me and Luke, at least, like I spent a lot of the first three years of Max's life trying to make up for my guilt of not being there present by just buying him everything. He had the nicest clothes and the nicest toys, all of that, but it didn't, that's not what he needed. Okay. Number four, 
This is a big one. You've talked, you're talking a lot about this on your program, educate yourself about the first three years. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about attachment and how that happens. I know that, um, I, I'm, I'm, people have heard me talk about it a lot. So if you want to take the floor on here, feel free. I know that you've had Erica on Erica Commissar yeah, um, yourself and she's great. So explain to, uh, it's better if this comes from you because this is about really people your age who are in the throes of nesting. Explain what you didn't know then that you know now that you would encourage other people to recognize as they begin the nesting phase or switch into the nesting phase. Um, I didn't know how important it was for your kid to have tons of time with just you and them when they're little, because I think everyone tells you like, they won't remember it. So it doesn't matter, <laughs> like do what you need to do. And that's true. They will not remember it, but that's totally leaving out the fact that they're not going to be securely attached to you. And so it's like, oh my gosh, that's a huge piece of someone's life and how they're going to behave in life and act in life. So for Mac, the first three years of his life, and even almost the first year of Charlie's life, I was working all the time. So they had nannies and daycare and babysitters, all these different people, but they didn't have secure attachment with me. I think one thing that I did right was I breastfed. So that did give me like time with them every day that was just me and them. And that was healthy for them. But um, you don't get to know your child if you're not there with them and they don't get to know you and you don't realize how important that is until like you wake up one day and they're three and you're like, why is he having this meltdown? I don't understand. And it's like the inconsistency and all these things. But truly the reason is they're not securely attached to you and that's what they need. And so you can have, you know, secure attachment, insecure attachment, there's a whole list of all these things, but I was seeing all the behaviors in Mac, like acting out, not being able to control his emotions, all these different things of the insecurities that he was having. I didn't know the educational terms to go with that, but I could see the consequences of me not being there. And so that's when I finally started reading your stuff and listening to Erica and all of that. And I was like, oh, well, it makes sense. And I, I don't understand why our society is so big on education go to school, spend all this money, you know, get a degree. And then I feel like once we get our college and postgraduate degrees or whatever, we stop and we just <laughs> think like, oh, you're just going to know how to be a good mom. And that's like, that's so stupid. <laughs> like, why would you quit <laughs> learning? Like, this is actually the biggest project you've ever had. It's a live being that needs to be cared for and fed and all these things. And so it's just, I think we think that their needs are so basic. Mm -hmm. And we they don't really require an dive, education. Yeah, that we don't dive any deeper than that. And that's just uh, goes along with the selfishness. But also, like, if you're working all the time, you don't have time and you're too tired to learn or to read mm -hmm. or do any of those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Well, so, it can um, be. Go ahead. And I do think that also, like, my mom was in church and had older women. This is back when the village was more of a village to like mm -hmm. train her and teach her those things. It's not like she had all these books that Erica Combs was, I mean, there were some books back then, but um, girls now my age don't have that. Like they're not as involved in the church or mm -hmm. they may have their mother. They may not have their mother, but there's not mentorship with older mothers like there used to be. So that part of the education piece is gone. Too. Just missing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head that people, I hear it a lot. People really do believe that if you don't remember something, it's not important. And you can kind of see how that would be easy to believe, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't understand or know anything about attachment, you can see that, you know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's easy to believe, but, um, and it's not even necessarily not true. It's like you said, there's just this whole other piece that people don't understand. And those attachment issues can and often do stay with you for life. And that's a oh, very totally. hard thing for people to understand and accept and, and even well to accept, um, that, that and you will carry it into your relationships, adult relationships. And, uh, if you did not bond with your own a lot of people if they didn't bond with their own mother then they don't parent their own babies because they don't know what they're doing either and it just perpetuates well i think you're seeing a whole generation of proof now like you look at all these i don't know what gen z gen what gen we're on now but these young kids 
they don't know how to communicate with anybody. They're all on their phones all the time, but they can't even speak to a person and make eye contact with them. And one thing I learned in Erica's book is like how important it is to like look, look at your at baby, your baby. Mm-hmm. and spend time. And like when they are feeling pain, don't mm-hmm. turn away, like mm-hmm. continue to look at them. And I'm like, oh, we have a whole generation of kids now that their moms worked all the time and they were in daycare. So the daycare workers can't look at 12 kids at a time for very long. And so these kids are no wonder they're all depressed and on all these medications and confused about their gender. It's like, we did this to them. Well, I'll move into number seven here now then, because I talk about, I mean, that was about not letting cell phones and social media ruin this phase of life. So Mm -hmm. basically what you just described was, was part and parcel of that Um, because it was much easier. Of course, there were no phones when I was home with my kids. So there was no distractibility that's calling at me. I'd have to, you know, yeah. So, so, so looking one-on-one and spending one-on-one time without being interrupted was natural. It was just right. part of how they were raised. I can't imagine raising babies. And I worry about my own kids with cell phones in, in those early years, because you're constantly getting pinged and pinged and pinged. And you have to be incredibly disciplined and purposeful in removing that from this experience of nesting in the and nesting can be go on for 18 years, but I mean, this phase of nesting where you're not just um, bringing the baby along for your ride while you work and are on your phone, but you remove the work and the phone and you're doing nothing but being focused on your baby. That is not happening or it's yeah. not happening nearly at the level it needs to be in order to become securely attached. So it's not just physically being there. That's, 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 that's a prerequisite to be there versus not be there, but then also to actually emotionally be there. My, one of the biggest moments, like that was a light bulb moment for me with Mac was he was, he's always, he was an early talker, but um, it was like seven o'clock one night and he wanted me to come out and watch him hit golf balls. And Luke was like, come on, Liz. And I was like, I've got to do this prequel letter for this client. And Matt goes, mommy's emailing and just slammed the door and walked out. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. There <laughs> what you have go. I done? Perfect You know, they example. called me like laptop Liz because I was always, always on my on phone and emailing and phone. stuff. And so I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to like raise my kids to be addicted to this stuff and think that it comes before the humans that are right in front of you. Like, my I mean, clients it- aren't going to come to my funeral. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully, I'm, my kids will. <laughs> I mean, imagine being a few months old or the first three years. Just, just pretend that you know. Close your eyes. Like I'm three months. I'm five months. I'm ten months. I'm fifteen months. I'm two years old, and the major person in your life, you don't know her without this attachment to her. This, this phone. This. Yeah. You don't know what she is like uh, without that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, my kids will walk around and pick up a phone and like act like they're texting and calling. And I'm like, oh my God, this means we're on our phones too much. Mm -hmm. If that's what they automatically go to and want to play with is because we show them that's what's important in life. They just learn it from us. And as somebody who has, is attached to her phone at this phase of my life, obviously I'm an empty nester now that didn't, I, I, I feel for people. I don't want to I mean, I can't imagine I'm, I'm thrilled that it was not around. So I didn't have to deal with it. But you can bet that I would figure out a way to remove it. I'd have to because I wouldn't feel right if I didn't. And I want other people to feel that sense of this isn't. And I think people do think, like you said, instinctually, this isn't instinctually. This isn't right. The difference is that you have to actually incorporate it into your daily life to be disciplined about, okay, this is the time I'm going to have it. This is the time I'm not, which sucks. You know, I -hmm. I wouldn't want to have to do it myself, but um, uh, that's just where we are, you know. And I'll say this, and it makes me feel very sad for moms that aren't able financially to take a step back and not work. But for me, well, it's much easier to ignore my phone if I'm not doing a job. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I mean, it's much easier to put my phone away if, if my paycheck is not dependent on it. So like that's Luke is like, why don't you text anyone? Now? I literally have, I feel like I've texted anyone in five months. I'm like, because I'm not a slave to it anymore. Yeah. It's yeah. So although you'd, you'd be surprised at how many uh, men I hear from whose wives who are necessarily not working at all are attached to it for social media reasons. And that's a whole different kind of addiction, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. I do think that we like distract ourselves into like not paying attention to our instincts too. And it's so easy to just open up your phone and scroll 
and then you validate what you're doing because everyone else is doing it. And it's like, oh, this is a real problem. But I, people, there's so much research now that people are like becoming addicted to them because like the dopamine and all of mm-hmm. that. And that's, mm-hmm. and it's stupid for us to think, well, it's just our kids. It's happening to us too. Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. So that's a good segue into the last one or the second to last one. Um, embracing, learning to embrace the discomfort and the yeah. unknown of this world that you is so foreign to you and think of it more as a challenge rather than as something to run away from, because yeah. it is going to force you to think and grow as a human being in a way that nothing else in life will ever do. Nothing, nothing, mm-hmm. nothing tops constant sacrifice of caring for this live human being who's totally dependent on you. Mm-hmm. And you are skipping the opportunity to grow. If you're, if you're constantly trying to run from your thoughts in your life by keeping yourself so busy and distracted that you're not caring because caring for baby is going to force you to slow down. And when you slow down, you have to think. And when you think you're stuck with yourself and your life and a lot Mm -hmm. of people today don't want to look at it. Right. Amen. Right. So embrace that because this is your opportunity to say, who am I? What do I want? What do I want to impart to this person? Who am I in the calm and in the uh, silence? not the noise and the distraction. I think at first for me, I was like super isolated and lonely and dealing with like, Oh my God, there's all these changes at one time. And I'm pregnant. Some of them like emotional too. Um, but now I'm trying to be thankful instead of feeling like let's throw a pity party for myself. I'm like, I get the opportunity to do this. Don't squander it. Especially after talking to Mark, like his mom literally his dad beat the crap out of her because she took their food money and used it to pay for him to go to school because she wanted her kids to have a better life than her. And I'm like, I can't even relate to that. Like how spoiled Americans are, but I'm like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to mess this up with my kids. I'm going to mess it up in some ways, but I don't want it to be because I didn't try. Mm -hmm. So I need to accept this challenge and take it on and do the best I can with it. And I think also like, if it's not going good for a week or two, don't just quit. Like I had a couple bad weeks and like, it's like, not going to go good for a week no, or two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably, I told, I had a friend actually, and a really smart friend. And she was like, Liz, it took me like a year to learn how to be a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, just voicing my frustrations to her. So she's like, calm down. Like, don't be so hard on yourself. Cause Luke had said like, do you want to go back to work? And I'm not going to lie and say it didn't like cross my Mm -hmm. mind. Of course, Mm -hmm. I was comfortable Mm -hmm. and good at work and like Mm -hmm. making money and stuff. But I'm like, no, it's I don't want to go back to work. I just need to like learn how to do this. But I feel like it's hard because there's not. Society is telling you you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. All these women before fought for you to have all these rights, blah, 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 blah. But then it's also like you are isolated and you're the weird one. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be okay with it. Well, that's funny because that was my last one. So that's what we're, that was it. It was how to deal with the isolation. That was my last point. I haven't um, figured that out yet. Yeah. And I wish I had, well, I'm just going to tell people what I did and then, and then maybe it can apply. Although I think it's harder today. You know, I, I had a group of mom friends who were also home. Uh-huh. I mean, there was probably six or seven or eight of us, a couple of them who were good friends and who are still, I'm still friends with today and others who weren't, they were sort of fly by night friends that came into my life and out because they were coming through town and yeah, moving away. Um, and I don't keep up with them, but for those few years, they were everything. Mm-hmm. They were everything. Um, that's what's missing because that was normal in the fifties and sixties and seventies. People were home doing it with you. Mm-hmm. And for everybody who's doing it, I mean, the average mom like yourself is going to understand that that's, that's everything like, oh, you don't have that. And if you close your eyes and just imagine having that, it'd be like, hell, I could do this forever. Right. Cause that is the village that you create, you know, the, um, where you're doing the same thing and you're on the mm-hmm. same page. If you want to create your own little village, that's, that's fine. But I, I was dissing the village concept initially, cause it was all about daycare and all that. Um, so I feel really badly for you, but I do think that it, it you can find it if you seek it out and just know that they don't have to be friends you're going to have for life. You can, if your good friends don't stay home, you can find friends who are just going to be around for a little while and that's okay. Yeah. And it's okay 
to be by yourself. Like I'm not scared of being by myself or anything like that. I'm totally fine with that. I just feel like you can, and you can still find mom groups. They're just mom groups that are doing things not the way that I want. To yeah. Be doing no, I, I know we talked about this. Do you know what I mean? I, I do. Uh, I wasn't the sit around the circle and love that's those, those songs. Um, yeah. if that's what you're getting at. And I, that wasn't who I was. Um, so I get that. I get that. There's ways yeah. of doing it without that, I think, but, um, it's just hard to find. Yeah. And I think one thing for me, um, that I'm learning now is I need to like, we're leaving our house a lot more for a long time. I just like stayed in the house because I was just like trying to figure out the routine and like what that looked like. But now I'm like, we should leave the house probably every day oh, and try amen. to like, Definitely. do something Definitely. just so that we have like human interaction with other people. So that by the time my husband gets home, I'm not like just biting his head off, you know, um, because talking to a toddler all day can be exhausting. But I think that um, you don't necessarily have to do the like whole mom group play date mm-hmm. thing all the time. You just have to find the people that work for you. Mm-hmm. I like, I met a girl actually, she's been a long time listener of your show and then reached out to me. And so she and I text, like we have a lot in common, but she lives in Oregon. And so mm. if I have like, and she's got four kids now and she's, you know, but I'll text her and be like, Hey, like, what do you do on this? Or what do you do on awesome. that? And so it's just, I think you, that comes slowly but that has been hard for me because when I worked, I was on the phone all day long and talking to adults all day long. And so now it's like a different, I'm just out of my comfort zone and I'm picky. I get it. I really do get it. And it will get easier as the older ones go to school and you meet, you know, you're right though. You got to be out. You got to be, out. you cannot be sequestered in your home all the time. That's not going to, you're definitely not going to find anybody that way. Yeah. You get really you depressed will. if you do And that. of course, another big piece to this is family. And if family is around to help, that's everything. And nobody mm-hmm. talks about that. I mean, I can tell you right now, I heard that growing up and I pass that on to my kids, and, um, especially my daughter, because you're going to want to be near your mom when you have kids and people don't tell you that in advance. And then you're stuck in some other state and then you get into the nesting phase and you're like, what the hell? I need help. And I, I can't get to my mom now. Mm-hmm or my sisters or whatever, your or brother or just whatever, your family. Um, and that was a norm back then. People had family. And, and when you don't, it makes the experience a thousand times worse. It just yeah. does. So the I isolation is my real. My siblings are here. So they're, they're my best friends. And right <laughs> now you're on a vacation with 18 family members <laughs> from what I hear. Yeah. Exactly. That's not isolation. <laughs> yeah. I do think also a lot of moms like they'll think because they're on social media chatting with people and stuff that they're like still connected, but it's not the same Mm -hmm. as like picking up the phone or going to talk to someone in person. It's actually more isolating to do that than anything else. Oh, definitely. Oh, that's like like, the biggest farce that social media is actually causing you to be more social. Not connecting you to anyone. Yes. Okay. So those, that was my list. And I hope that, um, you know, that is helpful to, to people who are trying to nest and going into this, like, what the hell do I do? Why was, why did nobody tell me this stuff? What's the truth from, you know, truth from fiction, yada, yada, yada. So I appreciate your coming on and doing this. I think it was definitely a thousand times better with you here than me just yapping away by myself. (laughs) Well, thank you. I don't know if I have anything figured out yet, but I am learning slowly. (laughs) Well, that's what I love about you is you're so open about, the whole experience. And there's just not a lot of people like that. And I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Suzanne. I've learned a lot from you and I hope that you keep up your work. Thanks. And once again, for everybody, her um, podcast is called Being Different and you can find that, you know, wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Oh, keep up the good work. I I heard you, uh, you had uh, Jordan Peterson's wife on that last week. Oh uh, yeah. She's had, awesome. Had, yeah. She's me. She actually talks a lot about the village. I actually interviewed her about what it was like when she was raising her kids. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yep. So yeah, lots of interesting guests. And, um, and I like your own personal stories myself, of course, a lot for obvious reasons, but okay. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Suzanne. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker show. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.